What do lockdown, self-isolation, flattening the curve, vaccine passports and social distancing have in common? Well, they're all phrases unknown to the general public until the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our lives and our entire world has been turned upside down thanks to a microscopic viral particle now officially known as SARS-CoV-2. Two years after the first case was identified, the world is still living under its tight grip, despite the extraordinary race to find a vaccine and to roll it out to the global population. But three important questions remain. Is vaccination really the answer to solving the COVID-19 pandemic? What role do other drugs have in preventing and treating COVID-19? And will we ever see a return to life as we once knew it? This is the show that answers those burning questions. This is COVID-19, The Debate. Hello and welcome to COVID-19 The Debate. My name is Dr. David Bull and I'm delighted to be your host for what promises to be a far-reaching and poignant discussion. Now this show aims to cover everything that you've ever wanted to know about COVID-19 but didn't dare ask. Well, to help me navigate the enormous complexity of the COVID-19 riddle, we've assembled a world-leading panel from all parts of the globe, and I'm delighted to introduce them to you now. So from Japan, Professor Ruby Pawanka. She is president of the Asia-Pacific Association of Allergy, Asthma and Clinical Immunology. She's also head of the Allergy Division in the Department of Pediatrics at Nippon Medical School in Tokyo. From South Africa, Dr. Marinda McDonald. She is founder of the Allergy Clinic and examiner for the Diploma in Allergology at the Colleges of Medicine in South Africa. From Turkey, Professor Arzu Yorganzioglu. She is Professor of Respiratory Medicine and ERS Advocacy Chair at Salal Bayer University Medical Facility in Manisa. From Belgium, Professor Guy Jus. He is Chair of the Department of Internal Medicine and also Head of Respiratory Medicine at Ghent University Hospital, Belgium. He's also former president of the European Respiratory Society. And last, but by no means least, also from Belgium, is Professor Sabine Allard. She is an infectiologist and head of internal medicine at the University Hospital of Brussels. So we're going to divide our debate into four sections and essentially ask four questions of our assembled panel. Firstly, what do we know about COVID-19 and what don't we know? Secondly, how beneficial is immunisation? We'll be talking about the global vaccine rollout and whether it really is the panacea that people first thought. Thirdly, what other drugs against COVID-19 are there? What does the evidence show? Which drugs work and which don't? And finally, we'll be asking how we learn to live with COVID-19 as it turns from a pandemic into being endemic. What exactly does the future hold? We're going to try once and for all to separate fact from fiction. The official definition of a pandemic is an outbreak of a disease that occurs over a wide geographic area, such as multiple countries or continents, which typically affects a significant proportion of the population. And of course, pandemics have occurred throughout history. Notable pandemics are leprosy in the Middle Ages, the Black Death in 1350, Russian flu in 1889, Spanish flu in 1918, HIV AIDS in 1981, and SARS in 2003. This COVID-19 pandemic is caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2. And as you can see, this is the atomic model of it. Now, it was originally called 2019 novel coronavirus after being first identified in the city of Wuhan in Hebei province in China. The World Health Organization then declared the outbreak a public health emergency of international concern on the 30th of January 2020 and then a pandemic on the 11th of March of that year. 
So what exactly do we know about this virus? Well, it's a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus that is contagious in humans, and it's the successor to SARS-CoV-1. That's the virus that caused the SARS outbreak. Now, it's believed to have zoonotic origins and has close genetic similarity to bat coronaviruses, suggesting it emerged from a bat-borne virus. The virus primarily spreads between people through close contact and via aerosols and respiratory droplets. Well, it's now time to get the answers to all of your burning questions. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome our panel to the studio from around the world. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you very much indeed, all of you, for joining me. We thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you're all you. looking splendid, may I say. Um, let, let's start with what we do know. If I may come to you, Professor Juice, first. How does the virus actually attach to human cells? Yes, the idea is that the virus is uh, attaching to the cells through receptors like the ACE receptor and also other receptors that are interacting uh, and, and that way uh, invading the, the body. It's a simple approach, uh, but uh, we have been uh, looking at the influence of diseases on the expression of that receptor. And apparently in some patients, uh, there is more of that receptor so that uh, they have a higher chance to get uh, COVID-19 disease. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that. And perhaps I could come to you, Professor Allard, and ask you, what determines susceptibility to COVID? Clearly, some patients seem to be more susceptible than others. Is this linked to COVID receptor expression? Is it lifestyle? Is it medication? What makes you more susceptible? That's a difficult question, of course. And um, I think it's, it's important to uh, define what we are talking about, because you can look at infection only, or you can look at symptomatic disease. And there also you have a whole range of mild symptoms to very severe sim symptoms. So um, it's certain that we have identified risk factors that predis predispose to severe COVID. And we know many of them, um, overweight or obesity, diabetes, hypertension. Um, but even in, in young um, healthy person, you see that sometimes um, the, the SARS infection if evolves to a severe COVID and we still don't have uh, identified everything. It will need time, of course. Um, but some examples um, um, have to make with uh, your, your own immune system. And what we know, for example, is that um, there are sometimes X-linked uh, deficiencies in toll-like receptor responses, and that might be one of the small answer why, for example, um, young healthy men might, despite a, a, a good health, still re um, develop a severe COVID-19 disease. Okay, thank you very much indeed for the moment. Perhaps I could be a bit cheeky and bring in uh, Professor Jorganzioglu. Um, tell me, uh, we, we heard there about susceptibility and, and people who might be more susceptible. Do we know who's less susceptible? Oh, <laughs> that, is, that is an interesting question. <laughs> uh, we know that uh, AC2 inhibitors are very important. And uh, in allergic patients and in patients with asthma, they have low AC2 expression. So this is an advantage for them. Uh, we can say that it, in the uh, beginning of the pandemic, we had the concern that our patients with chronic respiratory disease it will suffer a lot. But this did not happen. And people with asthma did not appear to be at increased risk of acquiring COVID-19. And we had many systemic reviews uh, that have not shown an increased risk of severe COVID-19 in our chronic respiratory diseases. And uh, overall, uh, people with well-controlled asthma are not increased uh, risk of COVID. So uh, it is important to have uh, the control of chronic respiratory disease. And uh, to me, uh, it seems that asthmatic and allergic patients had an advantage. 
So, that, so that's really interesting. Were you surprised by that? The fact that if you had, oh, sorry, I, all right, I'll come, I'll come to you, uh, Ruby. I, I, you want to come in there? She's very correctly mentioned the low susceptibility of uh, asthmatics. And we've done a survey uh, in Asia Pacific, which also shows that the comorbidity of asthma is almost minimal as also seen in other areas like the Lombardy area in Italy and so on. And one of the reasons what uh, this is seen is because of the high expression of TS2 type cytokines like IL-13 that downregulate the ACE2 receptor. So when the ACE2 receptor expression is downregulated, the spike protein of the virus has less opportunity to bind with the ACE2 receptor on the surface of the cells. In addition, there are also surfactant proteins like SBD and MPL that actually uh, uh, compete with the spike protein to bind the ACE2 receptor. And these a couple of reasons actually tweak uh, the um, asthmatic uh, patients and allergic patients to be less susceptible uh, to uh, COVID-19 uh, infection as compared to what you would see in normal viral infections like influenza or RSV where they are more susceptible. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for the moment, Ruby. Perhaps if I can bring everyone back. I mean, I've been reading, and I, I don't know whether this is true or not, and it's slightly a cheeky question. Uh, are smokers less susceptible to getting COVID? It's not something I would normally advocate, to be quite honest. Who'd like to answer that? There is, there is no, no uh, published, published evidence, evidence, but just, just uh, uh, you know, uh, sporadically, when we look at some patients who are smokers, we have seen that they have landed up with more severe disease. But again, there is no evidence-based data showing that. Okay, lovely. Well, let me bring in Professor Allard uh, now, if I may. So so just, I mean, obviously, I, I take the point that you, you made earlier that this is very much a field which we're learning far more about. Uh, it's been two years now of living with, with this pandemic. Do we know what determines whether a patient goes on to have a mild form of the disease, a moderate form, a severe disease? And indeed, can we predict which of those patients end up in ITU, which is obviously the biggest issue that we have in terms of uh, the hospitals being over capacity and actually the medical staff being unable to cope? Yeah, so of course, for the moment, it's very difficult to predict. And I think you have a combination of, of a lot of factors. It starts with, with the virus itself. Uh, yeah, for now, in our region, we are dealing with the, with the Delta, of course. But the type of the virus, the quantity of the virus, um, the, the immunity uh, of the person who is infected, um, is there a previous vaccination? Has there been a previous uh, COVID infection? And then the risk factor that, that I mentioned earlier. So it's not like we have a prediction model. Mm. Uh, I, I certainly hope we, we will in the future. But I think um, it's so complex. There are so many factors uh, interacting with each other that for the moment, the only thing we have is our experience where we see that um, once the, the the need for oxygen is rapidly increasing, especially in unvaccinated patients, uh, you know that um, the next 24 hours will be very critical. But that's the only um, almost certainty we have. Otherwise, it's really difficult to predict the outcome. I, I, I would like, like to add that the virus load is so important yeah. because uh, before we have our vaccines, healthcare professionals had very severe diseases because of this virus load, yeah. always with the patients during whole day. Uh, so the virus load is so important. Vaccination is so important. And the, there are some factors, some genetic factors that we don't know clearly now. Uh, but we are uh, investigating and older people uh, and the people with comorbidities like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, sometimes COPD. Uh, so these are the poor biomarkers uh, that, that 
that we may predict that there will be a poor prognosis. Okay, let me hold on to you for a minute, Arzu, because there is a lot of talk about uh, whether uh, an immunity which is derived naturally is better than immunity which is derived from uh, the vaccine. So how long does it take for, for a person to mount a natural response? If you have not been vaccinated and you get COVID, how long does it take you to, to mount a, an immune response? It depends from vaccine to vaccine. We have uh, inactive vaccines and we have RNA vaccines uh, that the duration differs. But I don't uh, believe that the infection and the vaccination immunization could be compared because there are many risks of the <laughs> disease there, we can see. So the vaccination is always better and is longer. OK, and perhaps I could come to you, Guy. Guy, can I just ask very quickly something that, that, that's been coming up a lot, which is can you get COVID more than once? I've read that the risk is low, something like 0.4%. Is that right? Um, it's clear that you can get it again. So I have seen it in several of my patients. Uh, the problem is that we don't know yet very well what is happening with the detailed immune response of those patients who get covid but it's certain that they can get it uh, again. And uh, we know see also that even vaccinated uh, uh, patients can get uh, COVID. So that's the other point of the coin. We know, of course, that they are very protective, but in the milder, um, in, sorry, in the patients who are, for instance, immune compromised, who have a serious underlying disease or who are very old, uh, we run there also into problems. Okay. So you can definitely have COVID uh, a second time if you got it uh, once. And the question is, how long does the natural immunity last? And secondly, how long is the uh, good protection by vaccines uh, la uh, lasting? Yes, and of course, that, that is a question that is, that is rumbling on. Let me bring in Marinda. Um, what this is, oh, sorry, I'll come back to you, Ruby, but let me bring Marinda in here and just say, you know, we, there is a great lot of talk about the way that these viruses are mutating. Um, now, in my, uh, in my experience, and from what I understand, that when the viruses tend to mutate, they actually may well become more transmissible, but they become less virulent. Is this something we're seeing or is it too early to tell? And, and particularly with, uh, with Omicron, which is obviously the variant that the UK is hit very hard by. I think what we need to remember is that it's very early on. So all the data I've got, I've kind of either got from some publications locally or um, from government websites, from colleagues. But it does look like Omicron is more transmissible. Um, in fact, the um, case positivity rate in three weeks went from 4.6% to 16% to 35% week on week. So it was a it was an exponential increase. And it's that exponential increase that um prompted the um the the group in Swane to send out samples to KZN and where they did the genome sequencing. So the sorry Karen. we are cautiously optimistic that it is um less um severe. But we must remember that we now have a mixed population group of um, patients that are vaccinated. We've got a 28% vaccination rate, patients that have had um, COVID, and with it is the virus that is less, um, gives milder symptoms. Certainly with us, the under 50 age group, um, this was the first um, hospital data that came out was that the under 50 age group was um, admitted more. But again, in our country, um, the, um, the vaccination rate in that age group is less than the about 60. So I think we one would need to wait and see whether it really is milder or whether it's not just the vaccine's effect. In Botswana, where the early cases were, um, the first four cases that were international diplomats um, was reported, uh, they have a 71% vaccination rate of the 1.3 million eligible people. And they've had no increase in hospitalizations. 
and they have no patients in ICU. Mm. So although we think that the vaccine might be less effective, in Botswana, they, it's, a, it's a real live case study that 71% of the population is vaccinated and they have no increase in hospitalization. And of course, all eyes are on South Africa where you are, because of course, as you say, you've seen it first. Now here in the UK and across Europe, of course, governments, and I don't want to be political, governments are concerned about this and you can see why and they're waiting for more data. Let me just wrap up this section on what we know about COVID-19. Does anyone else, Ruby, I know you wanted to mention one other thing. Do you, do you have one final point? Yeah, yeah, just, just one, one final, final point, point, which I think is very important, especially because of, uh, of all the people who have this vaccine hesitancy. Because um, as we discussed, the vaccines do give us protection, but it does not give us protection from a reinfection or from an infection for the first time, Well, I, like let, any let, other let vaccine. Just, the crucial just, thing carry is... On actually prevents severe disease and hospitalizations. Well, well, you jumped the gun there because we're coming on to vaccination in just a moment. So just for the moment, thank you all very much indeed for your thoughts and opinions on what we know about COVID-19 as it stands. Well, the key weapon against COVID-19, as you were hearing from Ruby, has been the rapid development and deployment of vaccines against the virus worldwide. And quite frankly, it has been a triumph of human science and logistics. But the big question, is immunisation the only answer to this pandemic?